Soils are the basis of all healthy productive systems and they're also the basis upon the ecosystems in which we all live, work and play. Today I'm with Dr Ivana Oliver from the University of New England just outside of Armadale and we're having a look at some basic things that everyone can do to understand their soils better, manage them better and achieve sustainable production outcomes. Now we're going to do a couple of really cool things. Ivana, you're going to take us into a soil pit and show us a few basic skills that anyone can learn quickly, but that take a lifetime to master. Oh, most certainly, Tim. It's all about getting your hands dirty in soil pit. Shouldn't yeah, they? with a few little techniques and tips that I'm going to give you, you'll be able to get in there, get your hands dirty and learn more about your soil. And then, this is the really cool part, we're going to go out for a walk through the environment. We're going to cover about 300 metres laterally and we're going to go up about 30, 35 metres in elevation and we're going to see, what, five different sites where the soil changes dramatically. Yeah, I've got five stops that I want to show you today, Tim. And so we're going to look at a topographic sequence of how soil changes as we move from the lower parts of the landscape up until the top and then also some of the management stuff and changes that we see along that topographic sequence as well and how they're impacting how our soils and how we manage them. So by the end of this video you should be able to understand how to assess your soils a little bit better. You should be able to understand how they change across an environment, what are some of the clues that you can look for, and then you should be able to get an idea of some of the management implications that different soil types provide people that are managing the land. Ivana, I can't wait. Let's get into soil. Let's go, Tim. <laughs> right, Ivana, so this is a soil pit, but it could be the cutting on the side of a road, could be anywhere with a surface of exposed soil, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly could. Talk us through what we do. So what's the first thing? We're just going to have a look at it? Yeah, so the first thing I would actually do is, is get a shovel or a little pick, and if it's an exposed road cutting, it's been open for a while, so just get it and just, just clean, the clean, face a, off. clean the face a bit so you can get some of that weathered material that's it's been weathered because it's been exposed and open just yep. freshen it up okay then the next thing i would do is is grab my squirty bottle yep just an ordinary squeeze just bottle an ordinary squeeze bottle with a bit of water and just give it a bit of a squirt particularly if it's dry because this can just help highlight some of the colors if we're, we're seeing some color changes it's really coming out now isn't yeah. it there's yeah. huge difference between this horizon that horizon and that horizon isn't it oh, it definitely is so in this soil type here we, as you've correctly identified we've got three different horizons yep and that's just a fancy word for layers of soil that have had some kind of development happening and so in this particular one here we have our, our first topsoil horizon and you'll see a lot of our roots and stuff are growing through it and it's slightly darker in color and that's due to the presence of the organic matter yep so all the good bacteria worms all of the dead grass material everything's going to be in this yeah this here. is probably your most biological active yep. portion of the soil is is at the surface and you can even see right here in the middle a little ant we just had a little ant go into yeah. this hole so if i'm smelling this what should i be smelling for uh, a real sort of earthy sweet kind of smell right is, that's a really good indication that a lot of the yeah, biology in the that. soil is, is functioning pretty well okay cool cool so if, we, if we're starting to get stinky smells like sulfur or stuff like that it could be an indication that we've got waterlogging problems in that soil there's something wrong yeah if we're not getting that sweet earthy smell yeah, there's probably definitely. a clue yeah yeah the how the soil smells gives us a clue of, of how it's functioning. And yep. As you've said, if we've got that really stinky, sulfuric kind of smell, rotten egg gas, very good indication that our soils are being waterlogged. So moving on down, we've got a real we've got a real change now between this horizon and this horizon, haven't we? Yeah. So the biggest difference you'll see between our top horizon and our middle horizon is is this presence of all these gravels. Yep. And it's similar in colour, slightly lighter, just because we've lost the same amount of organic matter. But when we talk about the soil texture, so that's the ratio of sand, silt and clay, Yep. they're going to be relatively similar. So I should get myself a handful of each of these. Oh, this yeah. is the next thing, this isn't is it? The we next should thing get myself a handful. Get, just pick away at it. Yep. Get yourself a handful. Yep. Crush it up a bit. Crush it up and add like some this water. This is like baking a cake, isn't it? So we're going to add some water with the same squirty bottle. Same just squirty ordinary water. tap water is fine. Just Doesn't have to be water. dehydrated or anything yeah. like that. Dehydrated water. <laughs> and what we're trying to do here, Tim, is is create a bolus, which is yep. just a fancy word for a boil of soil. Yep. So a nice lump. Just a lump of soil, and you you don't want it too wet. You don't want it too dry. It's a little bit Goldilocks, but kind of like modelling clay. 
Yeah, that's yeah, a good right, way right. to do it, yeah. Okay. And once we've got our bolus, we then do what's called a ribbon test. Right, oh. And the idea of the ribbon test. It's not these ribbons. No, not no. the ribbons you put in your hair not either. The ribbons you put in your hair. <laughs> that's only on Thursdays, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're a bit more fancy than I am. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> So if I crush it up in my hand, add more water. Yep. And it might take a few minutes to evenly get the water distributed, depending on how much clay and sand's in it. Yeah, mine's feeling a little bit sticky. Yeah. Just a little bit sticky Just to my hand. Bit, but it's now still that's probably clue, quite gritty as well. It is. Yeah. yeah. So, so what are these clues telling us? So if you've got sort of slightly sticky and helping to hold it together nicely, that's, yep. that's the presence of clay. Okay, yeah. If you're feeling that grittiness, yep. you can, sometimes you can see it on your hand and you can hear it as well. Yep. That's the sand fraction. Yeah, righto. Oh, There's the definitely soil. a sand fraction yeah. here, isn't there? There yeah. is. And so here we've got a that combination of the sand and the clay. Yep. So you get your bolus. Got my bolus. Create a bit of... Got our bolus. Then create a bit of a sausage. Okay. And we create our ribbons. And we're basically gently squeezing it between our thumb and our forefinger. Okay. And, and we want it to... How thick do we want it to be, Ivana? About three to four millimetres. Okay, so from the top to the bottom, from where your thumb is to where your finger is, about three or four mil. Yep. And you want to try and keep it even and consistent, don't you? Yeah. And then the idea is... We're having... We having a competition to see who's got the longest sausage here. Oh, I think we need to have a competition, Tim. All right, let's have a competition. And as we pass Pressure's it on. over our thumb and forefinger, it will naturally break under its own weight. Check this out. There's a lot of, oh, I reckon there's a lot of clay in here because it's sticky, isn't it? Yeah. All right, so we've got now, this length here is important, isn't it? Yes, so this is the length of your ribbon. Not how much is left up here, but there. Yeah, Righto. so what's broken under its own weight. And it basically, general principle is the more clay in your soil, yep. the longer your ribbon length will be. Yeah, righto. So this is about, about what, about two inches here? Uh, two and yeah, a half inches, something, something like, like that. Something like that. And yep. so... So is that indicating a heavy clay soil or a light clay soil? More of a, a light clay. Okay. So... So we should be able to get a really long ribbon in a heavy soil. Yeah, so if we have a look at our bottom horizon here yep. and try and texture that one up, yep. it's probably going to take us a while to actually get the water into it and mixed up. And this is another clue when you're looking at soil texture is how much energy does it take to actually break it apart, yep. get the water mixed into it. Because that's going to determine how much water can get through the soil. It's going to determine how it's going to work up when under, under a rotary hoe, how well it's going to rip, yep. whether the plant roots are going to be able to get through. So that's going to determine what sort of crop or what sort of enterprise you carry out on that land, isn't it? Yeah, totally I, does. I'm surprised how many people go off and buy their 10 or 20 acres dream home and they, they look at the kitchen and they look at the bathroom and they look at the fences in the paddock, but they don't look at the soil. Oh, soil's the first thing you should and be And then they at end up gym. getting sheep and putting them on wet, boggy ground and wondering why their feet go rotten. I mean, come on, look at the soil. Exactly. So this one's going to take a while, but I'll pull out some bits. So while we're doing that, in this sort of situation here, what sort of clues are we getting from the fact that it's got clay, it's also got sand, um, we can see some gravel in here. I can see little bits of gravel that are caught in here and I can see quite a bit of mottling down here. Now mottling means that it's getting waterlogged down there, doesn't it? Yeah, so this, this profile here, we call it a, a, a texture contrast in terms of its classification. And right. basically what that means is we've got a lighter soil texture in the surface in our A yep. horizons and then we have a significant increase in clay content yep. in our subsoil horizons. So that means you could put a dam in here and it would hold water quite well, wouldn't it? Probably would, yeah, depending on having the right type of clay. Yep. But given the current levels of uh, clay and the soil texture in this one, it's certainly a, a pretty It'll good It'll respond well to compaction. Yep. 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 Okay. And so here I've got my bolus, but basically it will ribbon out quite a long way. Yep. And we can feel, you can see on my hands, it's really sticking, sticking to, them, sticking isn't it? to my yeah. hands. So there's quite, quite a high clay content in this soil. Harsh is its, its best 
land use. Mm -hmm. And that's mainly because of this horizon here. Okay. The fact that this horizon has all these bits of gravels in them, mm -hmm. and it's sitting on top of this really heavy clay, gives me clues that this horizon gets waterlogged really easily. Okay. And so if you're trying to grow a crop in here... It's going to stunt it. It's, it's going to stunt it because in yep. the middle of the raining season, so here in Armidale we're slightly uh, summer-dominated rainfall, mm -hmm. uh, this is going to be absolutely saturated. Yeah, not when you want it. Yeah. And I've been down in this paddock in this soil pit before and the water can infiltrate our surface and this horizon relatively quickly because it's got that sandy kind of texture. Yep, and then it sits and, and pulls it here. can't get through this horizon because of all the heavy clay. Yep. And so it sits in here and just waterlogs this horizon completely. Yeah, righto. Okay. And so if you're trying to grow a crop or some pasture or something like this, this is a physical constraint of our soil. And yep. the only way that you can actually see that is by digging a hole. A soil test is not going to tell you that you have a physical constraint. And this is a big thing. People might say, oh, I've got my soil tested, but I'm still having problems. And it's because they haven't looked at the structure. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And often in Australia, when we get soil tests, we only do the top 10 centimetres, maybe the top 20 centimetres. Yep. But there can be things happening at 40, 50, 60 centimetres. That'll push back up. That will influence the productivity capacity of our our soils and our plants. So what are some other clues that we should be having a look for while we're having a look at our soil profile, Vanna? Uh, soil colour, particularly down in our subsoil, we sort of mm -hmm. briefly spoke about it, but here you can see we've got a combination of greys and the oranges and the, the yellows. Yep. When we've got something like this, we call them soil mottles. Yep. And basically it's telling us that in some parts of the soil, oxygen can get in and it's oxidizing the iron content. So these red bits here, yep, the so iron's the rusting as it were. Yeah, it gets rusty. Yep. And so that's good. That means that there's a pore network there that our water can drain through. There's cracks here. The oxygen can get in. There's room for habitat for, for nematodes and our biology and that kind of stuff. So that's good. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's slightly darker here, the iron doesn't get exposed to the oxygen. So it stays in a reduced format. So there is still iron there, it's just mm. a different colour because it's not attached to, to oxygen. To oxygen, yeah. Right. And so when we see this darker stuff, we can go, okay, the water is staying in here, waterlogged this part of the soil longer mm -hmm. than, say, this orangey-yellow kind of colour. Right. And that's the clue that you're getting up here as well, because you're getting those colours up here as well, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. Right. So if you, if you are looking at a soil like this, Always make sure you clean it off, wet it up a little bit with your squirty bottle yep. and get the proper colours out of it before you start to interpret. Now pH, um, people make a big deal about pH because it really is important. Certain elements can be over available or under available at different pHs. Um, should you test your own pH or should you rely on professional advice for that? Oh, pH is one of those things that we can easily do in our own backyard with a simple kit that you can buy from any good hardware store yep. and gives us a good ballpark indication. They're reasonably accurate. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. pretty good. And so if we have a soil that has, a say, a pH of 5, yep. so it's strongly acidic in terms of the soil scale, we often have problems with aluminium becoming available within that soil. Yep, which is bad for livestock and that sort of thing, well, stunts plant growth. Stunts our plant growth massively, because the way it kind of works is the aluminium effectively burns the end of the root tips, mm -hmm. and so the roots can't grow. If the roots can't grow, they can't access water and other nutrients to then be productive and, and grow at our above ground level. So a pH test on a road cutting near a property you're going to buy is going to tell you whether or not you're going to have to spend a lot of money online when you buy the property. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Give you a reasonable indication, but if you really wanted to dig into and, and pardon the pun, dig, dig into, into soil, dig into soil and there find out go. whether you should buy that property, I would certainly recommend getting uh, lab-based soil tests done. Yep. Go out, take some core samples from the farm that you're looking at. And don't just take them all from one paddock too, because soils vary tremendously, don't we? I mean, we've just been here with the students all day and we've been having a look at three different pits and there's been an enormous difference between all three pits, hasn't there? Yeah, it totally is. You, we could walk from me to you and you could have a totally, totally different, different soil type. So yeah. 
doing so, a... So walk around the paddocks spatial. with a spade. Yeah, yeah. And look for clues in the landscape and, and the soil types. You might have a change in, in colour at the surface, so you might go from a, a red to a black kind of colour. Yep. You could have different vegetation species present. That's pretty important, isn't it? Yeah. Looking at your vegetation. Vegetation is a, is a clue about what's happening underneath. And even areas that have been uncleared post European settlement, there's a reason they're uncleared. And that reason is often due to the fact that the soil type underneath is very poor and is not at productive capacity for agriculture as the original clearing practices. So there's a reason why the trees are still where they are. Because mm, mm, mm. the, the older farmers, they're not stupid. No, no. no. They're switched on. Ivana, if people want to find out more about soils, um, what should they do? Uh, first of all, Google is a wonderful place to start with. Yep. And particularly Soil Science Australia, they have a lot of information and videos out there about mm -hmm. how to do some of this soil testing. And universities are another place to start for soils, particularly the universities that do a lot of agricultural-based degrees and environmental degrees. Short courses, things like Short that. Short courses, yep. They'll often have uh, courses available that you can come and do this kind of stuff. Fantastic. And Ivana is, of course, at the University of New England, fantastic agricultural school here in the centre of New South Wales, doing great things and researching an enormous amount of things. Ivana, thank you very much for your time today. Hopefully thank people feel a little bit more confident having a look at their soils and knowing the basics of what they should be doing before they have a look at what they're doing on top. Thank you very much, Tim. And best advice I can give, get your shovel, dig a hole. Dig a hole. Love it. Beautiful. 100 metres along the creek, but only about 5 to 10 metres worth of elevation gain. And we've moved upslope along the road. So for this site, in terms of management and future uses, the best thing we can do is very, very light grazing so that we maintain our organic matter and our ground cover resources. Here we've had a change of parent material. So that source material that our soil has been formed from. So what we're seeing in our landscape today is a lot of the ridge lines have a basalt cap on top. And as a consequence, Underneath that one, you'll see the river gravels, and then underneath the river gravels, you'll see the earlier metasediment material.